Hello, it's Sora here from Wizards Code, and this is a simple first-person shooter that I'm building using assets from the Asset Store. It's kind of a road-like, and so I need lots of procedurally generated levels. And in my previous deadlog, linked up above, I introduced Dungeon Architect for generating these levels. And some of the comments in that video said, hey, how do we actually do that? What are the details behind that? And so this video is about that. I'm going to start off with a, a repeat of some of the content from that video, just a, a 30 seconds or so, which show how you create the rules that generate the dungeon. And that's what you're seeing here. Change the seed run it through a, a rule set and it creates a new dungeon for you. But the thing that people wanted to know more about was about how do you create the theme? How do you make it look different and how do you have variety in the rooms? And so that's what I'm going to focus on for the majority of this video. So let's get going. So to create an environment in Dungeon Architect, you create these rules. There are many ways of doing it. In this case, I'm using what's called the grid flow. And this essentially sets rules up that go one after the other and ultimately create a dungeon that looks like this when you're in the editor. So you start off with a grid and that defines the total size or the maximum size of the dungeon. And then you create one path, which is your main path. So this goes from the start point to the goal of that particular level, but you can then add paths off the side of that particular path and dead ends as we've got here. And um, we've done a couple of dead ends in this one. Also I've created um, in this one, I have created a um, mini boss room so there'll be plenty of treasure and things in there and then you can do things like spawn zombies in this case spawn zombies or you could spawn ammo crates or anything like that other things that you want and you can change the probability of them appearing at the beginning or the end of each level so these ones you get much more of them at the end of the level whereas the next ones um, these create light and make it a little safer for the player and so I have a lot more of those at the beginning of the level so it's going to get it's kind of a swap over effect. I don't worry about the rest of these here, they're just kind of um, necessary for making it work. So now we're going to look at how do we actually theme it, how do we actually um, decide what zombies get put where, what walls get put where and so on. So let's get going with that. Having set the Dungeon Architect objects up in your scene, you need to create a theme that will be used for the creation of your dungeon. So you do that by right clicking in your project window, select Create, and then Dungeon Architect, and Dungeon Theme. And this will create a default theme for you, and it'll have some of the initial markers that you need set up straight away. So we've renamed that to sewer theme, we'll open it up and here are the initial markers. Now each of these markers is going to be called by the dungeon generation and you put into these markers what you want to be placed when the dungeon generation calls it. So let's have a look at the first one of these and that is ground. In my scene here I'm using the 3D Forge Tyler Dungeon Sewer Kit which is really excellent. Lots of prefabs in there, lots of flexibility. It's a kit I know pretty well so I know precisely the piece of ground that I want. One of the great things about 3D Forge's work is he has a really good naming convention so it's easy for you to remember and find the pieces that you want. So here I am using the Sewer Ruins Tiles 4A and I'm going to drag the prefab into the theme editor here and it'll just create this little box for me. I can connect it up to the ground tab and then I can simply go in add the theme into my dungeon because I haven't done that yet so just drag that into the uh, themes area and click build and there we go I have floor tiles simple as that but we do want more variety in our floor tiles so what I'm going to do is go and find another one of these which is slightly different it has different uh, unevenness in the tiles that are on there so I'm going to add that in but you don't see any difference initially and the reason for that is we're seeing both of these appearing in every square so let's reduce the chance of this one down to 20 percent um, we don't consume on attach I'll show you why in a moment and then we're going to drop this down a little bit in height again you won't see any difference here but we'll show you why in a moment 
And then for this other one, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to drop it down a little bit in height, and then we're going to change the probability to 20% and not consume on attach. Now, that consume on attach would prevent it moving to the next level. But as you can see in the uh, picture here, we now have these tiles in some of the places that there was a floor. And so we're adding in an additional layer now, which is going to cover this whole area. And that will show you why we lowered the previous height, because it will allow these to merge in. I happen to know from using these before that those are the right settings. And now we have a complete floor set up, but you can see the unevenness on the left there. In the front left foreground, you can see some unevenness in the tiles. It just breaks it up a little bit. Um, if they were to be up higher, you would see ridges around the outside. And so that's just because of the kind of prefabs that we're using here. So next up is walls. We've got to have walls around our rooms. So again, I, I know this kit pretty well, so I know the wall I want to use. Just going to use one for now. We'll add more in later to add variety, but one's going to do for now. Unfortunately, they come in in the wrong angle, but it's really easy to fix. Just change the rotation and there you go. It works perfectly. Next up, we're going to want to add some lights to these walls so let's just make a little bit of space lights are not added by default by the dungeon generator so what we're going to do is we're going to add in our own marker and call that from the wall when the wall is added right click add marker node we're going to call this marker node wall light and then we're going to want to call that from the wall so when the wall gets emitted it will call the marker wall light and then we just treat that like any other marker at all in the system. So let's go find our wall light prefab. And again, I know my way around, so I'm just going to go straight to it. And we're going to drag that in, connect it up to the marker. And that's not facing out from the wall, it's facing into the wall. So we need to rotate this through 180 degrees. Okay, and that is now facing out from the wall. Uh, we might need to adjust it a little bit to make it fit the wall properly. So let's zoom in on one of these. Yeah, it looks like it needs to come out a little bit. Let's try moving it in the X position slightly. There, that's better, I think. And the next thing is there's too many. There's one on every single wall panel here. So we're going to use what's called a selection rule. This is a little script that will decide whether one should appear or not. And there's a few come with Dungeon Architects. So we're just going to use the alternative selection rule. And once we've put that on, it'll only appear on every other wall. There we go. That looks better. Not quite so many. So now let's just break up that wall a little bit. Let's put a bit more variety in. And there is a built-in method for doing this. It's called the wall separator. And the 3D sewer kit does indeed come with some wall pillars that you can use to act as a separator. So let's throw one of those in. And in this case, just the default settings are going to work just fine. And there you go. You see that it's just broken up a little bit inside of the uh, view there. Next up is fences. Now, fences are a uh, little bit unusually named. If you look at the demo levels that come with Dungeon Architect, you'll see why they're called fences, because in many of the demos, they are actually fences. But in a level like this one, they are um, kind of rough hewn areas, They're not really rigid and long walls like this. So I'm literally putting a fence in to start with. Um, I think later I will turn these into more cavernous kind of spaces, but the sewer kit doesn't have that kind of prefab in it. So I'd have to use another kit for that. Now this level, I'm having difficulty finding one. Oh, there's one over there. Okay, so there you can see it's not long pieces of wall. And just like the wall piece, uh, the angle is wrong here. So we're just going to turn it through 90 degrees. And there we go. We have our fenced areas. So now that we've got our basic areas laid out, let's start making them a bit more interesting. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to re rename the ground area to floor. And that's going to give me more flexibility with what I can do every time the ground marker is called. So I'll create a new marker called ground. And I'll have that call the floor marker, but that will then enable me to do some more things like call another marker for uh, room decor. I'll also be able to call another marker and add a ceiling in. 
Now, you should note here that I've put an empty game object in between the ground and the nodes afterwards. That's so I can have branching nodes. I can have multiple nodes being called from the same uh, space. But it also enables me to change the settings on that game object. I'm not doing it in this case, but you will see that happen a little bit later. Okay, to add the ceiling, we do the usual. We go find the prefab we want. In this case, I'm going to use a ground prefab, but I'm going to turn that prefab around 180 degrees so that it forms a ceiling. Uh, I'm also going to have to move it up three meters so it is above the player's head rather than below the player's head. Okay, so let's take a look of that in the uh, environments. So let's zoom down. We can't see it because we're on the back side of the roof, but as we go underneath, there we go. There is our ceiling. Excellent. So we can do some improvements on that, I'm sure, but that will do for now. So earlier on, we had this room decor marker, and there it is. So let's do something under that. Let's do something totally different to anything we've done before. Let's create a whole new load of uh, items to add into our level. So we're going to need a new marker. We're going to call this rubbish. And under this, we're going to put a load of rubble and things like that that are just going to scatter around the floor. So under room decor, we need a game object node, which is going to tr control that. And that will connect to the rubbish marker. Inside of that game object node we just created, we'll be able to adjust the likelihood of rubbish appearing on the floor. So to do that, we click into the game object node and we change this probability. So let's make it something like 4%. And if there is that there, we do want it to be consumed unattached. So we don't want anything else inside of that uh, zone or that space. And next up, we're going to put a whole load of assets underneath our rubbish marker. So we're going to find these by searching through um, rubble, there we go. There is one of the rubble items that we can have from the 3D Forge assets. We're just going to drag a bunch of these into our map and connect them to that rubbish node. We also want to set the probability of that type of game object appearing. Let's make it about 11%. We already know there's 4% of the chance of this node, this marker being called. So 11% for that one. And then we'll do 11% for this one too. And why 11%? Well, I happen to know that there are around about eight or nine of these. So I'm just putting in something that's kind of roughly going to spread it out. Um, on each of these, it is consuming on attached. So we're only ever going to get one of these on each 2x2 two two grid square. Um, or none, if it's below 4%. So if we have a look in the scene view, we can see that there are now some rubble piles there. So let's do the same thing. This time we're going to do it for fungus. So we add in an object mode. We decide the chance of that fungus or a fungus appearing in this space. So this will be, say, 5%. And then we attach that to a new marker, which is going to be a fungus marker. So we add in the marker node, call it fungus then go back and attach that to the uh, game object node that we just provided with a 5% chance. So there'll be a 4% chance of rubbish. If that's not there, there'll be a 5% chance of fungus occurring in any one um, node. And then in order to add our fungus, we just do exactly the same as we did with the rubbish. However, there's a lot more types of fungus in this particular uh, pack. And so we're actually going to do a number of different layers or levels here. So we're going to add in a new game object. And we're going to give this a access to another node. And this node is going to be a particular kind of fungus. So in this case, let's say fungus small. We connect that first node to fungus small marker by dropping in the marker connection, the marker emitter it's called. And we can then go on and add our fungus small in from the 3D Forge assets. And this is exactly the same as we did a moment ago with the rubbish. So we add them in and we give them a probability of occurring. And they will consume unattached to ensure there is only one fungus.
The difference here is when we finish this fungus small section, we're going to add a fungus medium and then a fungus large and a fungus bright and there's a few others as well. So at the end of this section, which I've got speeded up here, we will have a whole bunch of different types of fungus that might occur. So here we are adding the second one in, give this a probability chance of 20%, call it fungus medium and uh, then we can go on to the next and so on. So I've speeded it up even more here because it's really just a repetition of everything that we've been doing so far. But if you keep an eye on the scene view on the left, you will see it changing around as I add different things in and you can keep checking on things as you go. Next up, we're going to do something a little different. It's going to look the same initially. We're going to add in a new game node and we're going to attach that to a new emitter, which adds torture equipment then it's going to get a little bit different in that we're going to prevent the torture equipment from spawning in the middle of the room and only have it spawning against the outer walls and facing in a particular direction. And we're going to do that with what's called spatial constraints. So these are rules that define what space the object is able to be placed in. So let's go ahead and do that. Click on the game object that is connected to the marker node that you want to work on and then click on use spatial constraints. Then clicking on one of these points, we can create a rule and then add a constraint to it. So we're going to add a marker exists constraint and type in wall. Watch in the scene. See, it's all gone in the scene and it is only appearing by the wall now. If we fly over here a little bit, we can see a bit clearer but it isn't actually lining up the way that we want it. So let's move it over here. Okay, that doesn't appear to make any change. Why is that? Honestly, I don't know. I do a lot of this thing by trial and error. I'm sure I'll figure out the rules eventually, but let's do some more tests here. Let's try some more things. One of the things that I find works really well is to say, change the alignment of the object so that it matches precisely what's in this spatial constraints window. So apply fit rotation and then move the rule to the right place that they're going to be facing away from the wall, which is that one. So that appears to be behind the object. We've rotated it and now we see all of our torture equipment is against the wall and facing into the center of the room. Great stuff. So let's now add in a whole load of storage items and we're adding some nodes in here for shelves and barrels and pots and things. And I'm, I'm fast forwarding because you've seen how to do this. I'm also going to set up a quick spatial constraint on the shelves to make them only appear on walls. But let's slow down at this point because I also have them right next to doors here. But look, it's overlapping the doors on each side. So that's no good. So we're going to create a rule on either side and we're going to add another marker rule. We're going to say door this time, but rather than have it requiring a door, we don't want to have a door on the left hand side. Okay, and then we do the same thing on the other side and say don't appear if there is a door in this position. And what that will do is it will prevent the shelves appearing alongside any door. It will only appear in um, in places where there are other things either side, such as walls. And there we see there are shelves all the way along, but it stops where the doors are. Okay, so that's a little bit more of an advanced usage of the constraints. So let's go a little bit deeper still. Uh, I'm fast forwarding at the moment because this is just a repetition of everything I've done. I'm putting a whole load of pots in against the walls, and I'm then going to add in a whole load of different types of barrels. And then we're going to drop down in just a few moments into the spatial constraints again, where we're going to make sure that the barrels are organized around the room in a sensible way. So we're going to have these single barrels appearing in the middle of the room, uh, but not too close to the wall. And then we're going to have the stacks of barrels appearing along the wall. So let's do the these barrels that are in the middle of the room to start with. Let's first of all reduce the number that we're seeing. That's looking a bit better. And then we're going to create a spatial constraint. And we're going to do the same thing as we did before, except um, we're going to say don't have a wall in this place. So create a rule, uh, add a common marker rule in here, add in wall, and then invert the rule. 
and that will say no wall in this space here and then we're going to repeat that on each of the four sides what that will result in is having barrels that never appear against a wall in any position around the room. Now, as I flew around in this during play, I realized that I actually had some barrels that were appearing in front of doorways and blocking the doorways. So I'm going back in, I'm going to add another constraint to each of these, and this time I'm going to say door and I'm going to say don't allow a door there and I'll repeat this on all four so now I'm saying there mustn't be a wall and there mustn't be a door in this place so now we need to do something a little different which is with these stacks of barrels the first part of what we're going to do is going to be the same we're going to wire everything up and then we're going to use the constraint rules on the main node to only place these against the wall so that's familiar to what we've done before if we take a look at what's happening here all of the barrels are indeed against the wall but they've not got the backs against the wall so we're going to go over here and select that node and then just click the apply fit rotation and they turn to have their backs against the wall in every position but then as we look around we're going to find that some of these barrels clip into the walls when they're in corners of the room and so we're going to need to stop those from occurring in the corners of the room and this is going to be fairly predictable at this point. Um, what we have to do there is we have to prevent the barrels appearing when there is a wall on either side of them. And we do that quite simply by creating a constraint for those barrels on each side, saying don't provide a wall there. And it will look like this. Right, let's have a look at another technique for controlling the constraints here. Let's put some pillars in the room. Now, I don't want these pillars to be regular. The idea is that these pillars are here holding up weaker parts of the ceiling, and some of them are going to be destructible, which makes the ceiling collapse, and you can kill a whole load of zombies all at once with this approach. Um, so we do want random pillars appearing around the room and we could do exactly what we've done with the barrels and just have them not appear next to walls, not appear next to doors and have them spread about. But that did result in having pillars too close together like this. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into the constraint rules for the pillars. We're going to add in new rules that are in the quadrants next to where the pillar is going to be created. And we're going to say, just like we did with the wall areas, don't allow a pillar in this space. And what that means is we won't get pillars right next to each other. And when we finished it, it'll look like this. Okay, we don't have enough pillars now because we're filtering so many out and that's easily fixed. Simply raise the probability of a pillar occurring. So that's everything that uses the default markers and markers that derive from those default markers. So we have ground that has things like the mushrooms and the barrels on top of it. But what if we want to add something in that is not part of the default theme that is created by Dungeon Architect? Well, it's really easy. Inside of the mechanism I'm using here, which is the grid flow dungeon, is the ability to spawn specific kinds of objects. And here you can see some spawn items. This one, for example, is spawning the ammo crate. And if I scroll this across so you can see the uh, inspector, you see it's using the marker name ammo. We can create a new marker, we call that ammo, and then we just drop our ammo crate in just like any other marker. And now we can spawn ammo in using that spawn emitter in the grid flow definition. And if we have a look over here, filtering for ammo, we can see where it's placing them inside of our dungeon. And we use the same technique here for placing our zombies. Let's take a look at that. As before, here we see that the zombies are placed with a zombies marker node. So we go and create a new marker node, call that zombies, and then simply place our zombie prefabs into the system, just like we've done with everything else. Okay, and there we have it. We have a complete dungeon theme. 
Uh, we could make some significant improvements, add some more variety and so on, but this is a really good start and you now know how to do it. What you're seeing on screen now is the current status of the game. Uh, we have our zombies in here. Lots of fine tuning to do yet, lots of improvements to the animations. The AI is a little bit aggressive right now. Uh, but the basic core loop of the game is now complete. So I'll be doing future devlogs and tutorials like this one. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button, follow the progress. Make a comment if you want to see something or want me to go into a little bit more detail about something. Thanks a lot. See you soon.